All right. Uh, good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get uh, started today on our uh, <clears throat> just general thematic review. So this is, again, not the unknown slides. I believe you guys had a nice session with Dr. Ray on uh, Friday about uh, unknown sessions. So today we're going to talk about um, urticarial and neutrophilic dermatoses. So just before we kind of get started, let's, let's talk about the concept of, of uh, urticarial processes. So, you know, we have things like uh, a prototypical pattern or a prototypical disease. We often will use uh, kind of a, a suffix on that and, and say something like it looks like, like lichen planus, we'll call it lichenoid, for example, if it looks uh, like urticaria clinically, but it's not really urticaria, we call it urticariol. And uh, we all know that urticaria tends to come and go quickly. Lesions last less than 24 hours. The episodes can last for days, months, years, but the individual lesions only last less than 24 hours. In the vast majority of cases, they last longer than that. Obviously, we get concerned about it. But if you see lesions that are fixed, they aren't coming and going. They don't have any scale. They involve mostly the dermis. So remember back to that first lecture I gave you when you picture in your mind's eye where the pathology is located. You're not going to see much in the way of scale or epidermal change in an urticarial lesion. So if you're talking about something that's urticarial and it's scaly, you know, that's incorrect. That's not a correct analysis. It needs to be non-scaly and have mostly dermal involvement if we talk about urticarial. And there's a lot of different things that can be urticarial. You see things like you know, the urticarial stage of bullous pemphigoid, for example. Um, erythema multiforme in an early stage can be urticarial. Um, lupus, uh, tumor LE, those lesions are urticarial. So they look like urticaria from a morphologic perspective, but they're not uh, urticaria itself. But we're going to talk today about true urticaria in some of these examples. And so uh, we're going to start off looking at a classic lesion of just garden variety urticaria. And here you see uh, and infiltrate in the dermis. And, and usually in lesions of urticaria, this is more inflammation than we often see, but there's a spectrum. Sometimes we can see almost no inflammation in the epidermis. We look low magnification, say, wow, that looks perfectly normal. Uh, we, I think the next case shows more like that. Uh, sometimes you can see a relatively brisk infiltrate in the dermis. Sometimes it could be massive inflammation in the dermis and it's really urticaria. And there's even cases of, of vesicular urticaria, which is so edematous, it actually can lead to a secondary blister. Now, most of the time, if you get dermal inflammation that leads to vesiculation, it's papillary dermal uh, edema that leads to that. But in some cases of real honest to goodness urticaria, you can get dense infiltrate in the dermis with edema that ultimately leads to a secondary blister. That's relatively rare but it can happen. And if it does happen, one of the most common situations is people that have pressure urticaria. They can actually get such an, a relatively dense inflammatory infiltrate that they can actually get a secondary blister. So here we see a dermal mostly infiltrate. And notice one of the other things about urticaria, it's one of the few uh, in disorders that gives you mostly interstitial infiltrate. Now, one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about this, these slides that I'm looking at here, I'm looking at them blind today also, just like you've never seen these before. So if I were looking at this, I, I would say this, this may not be urticaria angioedema. That's what the diagnosis is written on it. But I think this could possibly have been something else. It might have been erythema multiforme that happened in an early stage and was urticariol, which is okay. At least we're looking at something that's, that's kind of interesting here. But uh, you can see that this one has an interface dermatitis with some alteration of the cornified layer. And notice that it's got a basket weave cornified layer. So there's no way this was going to be scaly at this point in time. Whenever you get a basket weave cornified layer like this, overlying any abnormality beneath it, it can't be scaly yet. Now, if you biopsy it in, in maybe two or three days, when this is sloughed off, it very well could give you uh, some scale and that sort of change. But this lesion, to me, was more like, let's, let's call this an urticariol lesion that probably, it's got some interface change here, is probably an early lesion of erythema multiforme. So this is a, a lesion, again, we're talking about the concept of urticariol processes. This isn't really urticaria, it's not really, it's not really angioedema, it doesn't have any eosinophils in it, so even though it's labeled as urticaria angioedema on the little list of things we're looking at here, 
it's not correct. This is not an example of, of urticaria. You never get this kind of change in a lesion of urticaria. There's some dyskeratitic keratinocytes. So I suspect this was mislabeled in our teaching collection. But anyway, it's good, it's good to know because it talks about the concept of urticarial lesions in early stage of, of uh, erythema multiforme can look urticarial. And this would not be scaly here, uh, but in a couple of days you biopsy it and, and yes, it, it probably would be. Now this is more typical of what you see when you biopsy the lesion of urticaria. Low magnification, um, it doesn't look like anything. You say this looks like normal stent, okay? Now I'll get this right in a second here. There we go. It's my birthday today. I'm getting older, not younger. Maybe I'm getting Parkinson's disease or something, but <laughs> these things are pretty finicky to, to move around with this thing here. There we go. So low magnification looks normal. Okay, so your differential diagnosis of normal skin at low magnification needs to include things like uh, urticaria, like we're talking about here, uh, possibly a pigmentary disorder, vitiligo, uh, post-flectory hyperpigmentation, xerotic dermatitis, that didn't give you much change, um, you know, things like that, and we see low magnification, drug eruption, you know, things of, of those nature. But as we go to higher magnification, you see that there is some inflammation here, and urticaria is one of the conditions that gives you an interstitial mostly infiltrate, okay? And notice that this has no epidermal bulb. So this is what you're supposed to see. So this is a classic form of an urticaria, urticarial type lesion that we see under the microscope. Interstitial mostly, a little bit of perivascular, but mostly interstitial. So we've talked about that too. Um, if you see an interstitial mostly infiltrate that's got lymphocytes, got eosinophils, it's got neutrophils, um, that's a classic pattern for urticaria. And if we were to see something like this, that'd be the first thing I would think about, the urticaria. Now, looking at the various types of urticaria, it, it's hard to tell them apart. Just like when you, you know, the allergists kind of sit there and look at case and try to do that, but um, I've never been able as a histopathologist to be able to tell the difference between the, to the clinician that, okay, this is gonna be urticaria caused by a drug or it's gonna be a heat-induced urticaria or pressure-induced urticaria. There may be some things, like I mentioned before, if you get a really, really dense infiltrate with edema, maybe pressure urticaria, but I just really can't say for sure. And a dermal graphism could look like this. So anything that can cause urticaria can do this. And you get urticaria that develops with systemic illnesses. as a manifestation of lupus, for example, obviously related to drugs, to infections. So urticaria is a reaction pattern. Lots of things can cause it. So once you get it, then the burden's on you to make the diagnosis of why they have their urticaria. And we all know that a, a large number of these cases are just idiopathic. We don't know, you know what causes them. But this is a classic pattern, a diffuse infiltrate with EOs, with neutrophils. And sometimes you can get lots of EOs and relatively few neutrophils. Sometimes you can get lots of neutrophils with relatively few eosinophils. And uh, so we have a, a disorder called neutrophil-rich urticaria. And that brings in the differential diagnosis of things like uh, some of the auto-inflammatory disorders, um, familiar Mediterranean fever. Uh, those conditions can give you a neutrophil mostly pattern that looks like this. Lupus can sometimes give you uh, a neutrophil-rich urticaria in the infiltrate. So this is the classic pattern of just garden variety urticaria. Notice that there's no involvement of the epidermis. So this is what you should see, no scale. Um, so this is, is just a classic example of, of good, good old fashioned urticaria. And again, it's, it's hard to be sure what's actually causing this. You know, this person could have angioedema. You know, that could look very similar to this also. Okay, so that's, that's urticaria. Now we're gonna talk about urticarial vasculitis in a minute, but I will say that for every biopsy we get of rule out urticarial vasculitis, there's probably a thousand or more, maybe more, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000 that are just garden variety urticaria. So urticarial vasculitis is a rare phenomenon. Um, you know, basically patient comes in and then you add they, the clinicians start asking them all these questions. And we all know that patients are notoriously poor uh, historians and I'd say, well, have the lesion been present for more than 24 hours? They go, oh yeah, they've been present for more than 24 hours. You know, do they hurt instead of uh, itch? But they go, yeah, yeah, these burn, they stink. And they, you know, they, are they bruising? Well, yeah, you know, look, okay, so there's a little bit of bruising there. So you can easily talk yourself into a diagnosis of urticarial vasculitis if you want to. Uh, 
that the vast majority of these are not that. It's usually that the episode has been going on for longer than 24 hours. And patients will describe their symptoms in all sorts of different ways. Um, you know, they may say that they sort of have a tingling or burning sensation rather than it being, you know, classically prick, and it's still urticarious. So don't let those things guide you down the, uh, the pathway of urticarial vasculitis when it's just garden variety urticaria. Now, there are real and true cases of that. We'll talk about that in a minute. And sometimes we see patients that really and truly have the clinical stigmata and they really have impressed for 24 hours or longer and they really do have hypocomplementemia and maybe they have lupus. So there are cases like that. And then you biopsy and it doesn't show vasculitis. It shows just kind of a pretty classic form of urticaria. So you can't always use your biopsy to help you there either. But just realize that the vast majority of the time, it's just bad history and, and clinicians kind of get led down the garden path. Now, this is another example of an urticarial process that um, isn't really urticaria. This is pretty urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy. And uh, this one <clears throat> has got a little bit more perivascular infiltrate than usual. But the main change are those you look interstitially and you see the uh, abundant eosinophils here between an oncology bubble. So that's the classic pattern of pup. And you may see a little bit more perivascular infiltrate. That's kind of variable. Sometimes you see more than others. But um, this, this, again, you need history on something like this. If you just saw this uh, in a non-pregnant 75-year-old person, um, it obviously wouldn't be pup in that situation. But you, would, you can still look very much like it. So it looks pretty much like other forms of urticaria usually doesn't have as many neutrophils as you see, like in urticaria, that classic urticaria, they can give you some, some neutrophils in most cases. Um, this usually does not have neutrophils in, in most cases. So this would be pup. But again, notice that it's got no epidermal involvement. Okay. And then this, you know, you really pretty much have to uh, know that the person's pregnant or you might not sign it out as that. You might call it maybe a, a bug bite or something like that because papular urticaria the synonym for uh, basically arthropodosol reactions can look sort of like this also. This doesn't really have a wedge-shaped infiltrate, but that's in the differential. You see something like this as well. So um, again, another example of a process that's sort of carry all with an interstitial mostly infiltrate with some perivascular inflammation as well. Now you might say, well, okay, pregnant woman, different diagnosis is between pup and, and the herpes gestationis. What does the urticarial stage of HG look like or pemphigoid gestationis? And it looks exactly like bullous pemphigoid. And I don't, that's kind of why the diagnosis of uh, pemphigoid gestationis is probably a better diagnosis than herpes gestationis because there's no herpes involved. It was actually originally called that because the lesions were sort of herpetiform clinically, but it's not caused by any virus, obviously. If that looks pretty similar to the urticarial stage of bullous pemphigoid. You get a band-like infiltrate of lymphocytes and eosinophils in a band just beneath the epidermis with some spongiosis. And if you're lucky, you'll see a little bit of incipient subepidermal fasciculation. So it looks different than PUP, which is more interstitial, diffusely in the dermis, looking pretty much like we see with just classic garden variety or carry. Let's take a look at this one again. This, this is uh, labeled as urticarial vasculitis. And uh, there's two um, sort of settings where you see urticarial vasculitis, okay? If you biopsy a lesion of early classic leukocytoclastic vasculitis, there's two things that you can see clinically. So let's say somebody comes in, they've got, uh, maybe they've got HSP and they're getting early stages of that. Um, if you biopsy it in, in, in day one, early on, Clinically, you may see either petechiae or you may see little tiny urticarial papules. That's also a form of urticarial vasculitis. Now, the classic sort of urticarial vasculitis that the rheumatologists use, they're not thinking that, but just realize that in early stages of LCV, you can see lesions that look like little small lesions of urticaria. So early on, it can be urticarial, you biopsy it, and it shows this pattern, an infiltrate of abundant nuclear dust We've talked about this when I believe I've given you a lecture on, on vasculitis before, but if you see something like this, it's got lots of nuclear dust in it with some EOs and neutrophils, you should be thinking of an early stage lesion of LCV, and this can be uh, an urticarial lesion that's going to go on to be more classic palpable purpura 
like lesions of, of uh, vasculitis that we see. Now, if you see somebody who's got classic urticarial vasculitis with the bruised lesions, the lesions that look like urticaria, you know, that sort of process, it's not just an early lesion of LCV. It can look like this, but it can also look like a kind of a florid lesion of urticaria without any real significant amounts of nuclear dust in there. And then if you see a really bona fide lesion, you'll see fibrin in the walls of the blood vessels and thrombosis of lumina. But if you see an early lesion like this, this is what we see when we see early LCV and in some lesions of so-called urticarial vasculitis. And again, that's a clinical pathologic diagnosis. The patients usually have hypocomplementemia. They've got the classic clinical picture of the lesions that really and truly don't go away in 24 hours. They're often indurated. They often have a bruised morphology because of the extravasate erythrocytes. And the biopsy can look like this, or you can have a denser infiltrate that's mixed with EOs. And if you get a good diagnosis, a good biopsy, you can actually see the vascular involvement. But here we don't see the vascular involvement. This is an early lesion. If you do even know fluorescence of a lesion like this, you may see fibrin in the walls of these blood vessels and some thrombi, you won't see thrombi usually, but you may, be, may see some fibrin and you may, be, may see some immunocomplex deposition with immunofluorescence. If you do a PTAH, phosphotungstic acid hemotoxylin, we don't really do that stain that much anymore, but it is a stain for fibrin that you can sometimes demonstrate the fibrin in the blood vessels. Um, if you do that stain with a, you know, on a paraffin, embedded formal fixed tissue. So you can actually look for fibrin with that stain if you want to, but you don't really need to. If you see this pattern in the context of the clinical, you've got a diagnosis, you don't really need to stain. So uh, we like to discourage stains. Um, stains are great, but they're often overused. Okay, so here's another different pattern. So we've moved out of the urticaria lesions and we're now moving into the neutrophilic dermatosis uh, sort of theme of the week, if you will. And these lesions may appear urticarial clinically, okay? So if you see a lesion of somebody that say got Sweet's disease, Sweet syndrome, that lesion may look urticarial also. No scale, dense edematous papules, nodules that coalesce into multinodular plaques uh, with no scale. So again, you, you see a patient with, uh, with Sweet's and they just don't have one bit of scale on there. And you might even see, you might even think it's urticaria. You might biopsy and send it in as urticaria. And this is what you see under the microscope. It's a classic pattern of a dense nodular and diffuse or dense diffuse infiltrate. Not really nodular here, sometimes nodular, but this time no. Dense infiltrate, you can even see low magnification. Some of these are probably lymphocytes down here, but these are different. These are a little lighter, a little salt and peppery. So we know they're gonna be neutrophils and go to higher magnification. Lo and behold, they're all, everything just about is a neutrophil here. Lots and lots of neutrophils, maybe some EOs, but mostly neutrophils here. And then you've got this papillary dermal edema. Now, there are some cases of sweets that can give you a fairly dense infiltrate of EOs. We just had a case the other day of a person that had a, an eosinophil-rich sweets, and it was a person that had an, a problem. They had an elevated circulating eosinophil count. So rather than just putting neutrophils into their biopsy, they put EOs in there. So if somebody's got eosinophilic leukemia, and we know that leukemia can be associated with sweets, they may have sweets with lots of EOs in there. So even though the textbook talks about uh, newts, dense diffuse infiltrate with papilloderma edema, classic for sweets, um, you can actually get some forms that have a lot of eosinophils in there. So just again, as my old mentor, Dr. Freeman used to say, there are a lot of things in textbooks and much of it is true. Um, this is the same sort of deal. This has got, this is, you can see EOs in Sweet's uh, disease sometime as well. Now, differential diagnosis of this pattern, you've probably heard of Bullis pyodermogangrenosum, and some people talk about Bullis Sweet's. Well, Bullis Sweet's disease is basically this, we get the papillary bleeding that gets so prominent, it forms blisters. So it's not really a primary blistering disease, and that's an important thing to, to remember as well, another teaching point. Um, you get a lot of diseases that can give you blisters that aren't considered primary blistering disorders. And this is one of those. Um, bullous lichen sclerocytotrophicus is another one. It's not really a primary blistering disease. Bullous lichen planus, erosive lichen planus, not a primary blistering disease, but you can get blisters that develop in these conditions. So important to remember that. Bullous arthropodosol reaction. 
Use the superficial and deep wedge shaped infiltrate. And in patients that have an underlying hemologic disorder or have some sort of an underlying immune deficit where there's a Th1, Th2 shift, they get massive responses to their bug bites. They can get blisters. Um, again, you get lots of eosinophils in those conditions. Those can also look something like this. And bullous pyrogangrenosum, there's a lot of overlap between sweets and pyrogangrenosum. And a lot of people think maybe they're very closely related. Maybe they're part of the same spectrum of the disease. Um, you know, tend to be more of a lumper. And so uh, to me, I kind of tend to think of it that way. They're both associated with systemic illnesses. Um, they both uh, have lots of neutrophils. They both give, uh, can ulcerate and get vesicular. So they're probably in the same family of disease and they both have lots of neutrophils in there. So this is an example of a sweets disease. And again, if you get this diagnosis, you're obligated to work the patient up uh, to make sure they don't have some systemic illness associated with it. And one other thing I, I wanna mention real quick here while we've got the slide up here, whenever you get a dense infiltrate of any inflammatory cell at all, histiocytes, neutrophils, whatever. You have blood vessels that are there, they live there. So when you get this dense infiltrate, they can become inflamed, okay? That doesn't mean that there's a primary vasculitis associated with that. So beware of getting diagnoses of vasculitis when there's just a lot of secondary inflammation. So sweets, pyrogranosum, um, yeah, it's going to inflame the blood vessels because they happen to be living in the vicinity, but it's not a primary vascular inflammatory process. So if it's a larger blood vessel and they're inflamed, it's secondary vasculitis. You know, the blood vessels are, are truly inflamed, shouldn't be inflamed, but they are. So it really is a vasculitis, but it's not a primary the blood vessel isn't the primary target of the inflammation. And that's an important thing to remember also. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this one. Here we actually have a real honest to goodness diagnosis of pyogenic agronosum um, where we actually got the inflammatory infiltrate. Now, the problem with, with pyogenic agronosum is that usually people have ulcers with pyogenic agronosum. And I don't know how many of you out there love biopsying lesions of ulcers, um, but most dermatologists don't like to biopsy ulcers. Um, they basically, it's already ulcerated it's on the leg, they want the ulcer to heal. And they, you know, they're gonna take a biopsy of it, it's gonna, it's gonna slow down the heal. So they don't wanna biopsy ulcers. And, and, but sadly enough, there's certain things in medicine, you just have to bite the bullet, you just have to do it. And uh, if you don't wanna biopsy, well then send it to a surgeon. And then the type of biopsy that you have to do, unfortunately, um, is usually an incisional biopsy. And you usually need to go from the center of the ulcer or into the ulcer bed, and you have to take an incision out of the rim of the ulcer as well. If you take a punch from the rim, you may not get the diagnosis. It'd be nice if you would, but you often don't. We see biopsies at the rim that just show some stasis change or some epidermal hyperplasia, and it's not diagnostic. If you biopsy out of the center, you may just show scar and dilated blood vessels as well. So you really need to biopsy that purple edematous border and it's really nice if you can to get an incisional biopsy if possible. And, and, and nobody likes to do those. So, but, but that's sadly enough what you may end up having to do. Well, this time they actually got away with it. They took what it was a deep shave saucerization biopsy. And notice here, as opposed to the sweets case, we've got epidermal necrosis. So this epidermis that's dying and becoming necrotic and sloughing away is forming the blister, the bulla, of the pyodermic agronosum, the ulcer. And here we've got this sea of neutrophils. When you've got this, um, as my good friend Jim Patrick used to, Fitzpatrick used to say when he was doing dramatic pathology, it's Miller time. So this is classic here, beautiful. Doesn't get much better than this. So sea of polys, ulceration, um, usually on an area where there's like, notice the pseudoepithelioma is hyperplasia. So this is off to the side of this lesion. So this was the, probably the border of it. This is the ulcer in the center of it. Uh, so this is pyogenic agronosum. So if you see this, you, you, again, you do have the diagnosis. You don't really, I mean, you can stain this to make sure it's not an infection, but this is exactly what you should see in pyogenic agronosum. So we get lots of biopsies of real life pyogenic agronosum, just like we get lots of biopsies of uh, urticaria also. And uh, this is a situation where it's not, hang on a second. Let me, let me call you back. I should put it on do not disturb. We'll call me in a couple of minutes. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so if you see this, 
you're home free. You've got the diagnosis. We see lots of them. They get biopsy and they just show scar. They show stasis change. They show the edge of an ulcer. This is what you have to get to get the diagnosis of platter diagnosis. Okay. So uh, this a little different ball game. Now we've got a shave biopsy, volar skin, looks like a dome shaped lesion, probably a nodule. And notice here, we've got again, a, a dense nodular and diffuse infiltrate of cells. And notice that they're kind of pale at low magnification. Not all of them are histiocytes. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of see why they look like this in a minute. But as we go to higher magnification, you see that actually what's going on here is that there's prominent vascular proliferation here. There are all these blood vessels here. And between the blood vessels is fibroplasia. So there's almost like there's this onion skin fibrosis surrounding the blood vessels. And then there's this mixed infiltrate of neutrophils and there's some eosinophils in here. And in some areas, if we're lucky, we might even see some little, uh, you know, cholesterol clefts. I don't really see many of those here. But this is near volar skin. You've got these blood vessels with this perivascular um, onion skin fibrosis with neutrophils and eos mixed in there. And when you see that pattern together like this, when it's, it's a diffuse process, nodular and diffuse over the whole thing, classic for erythema elevatum diutinum, EED. The other name for that is extracellular cholesterolosis. The reason it's called that is not really, um, uh, you know, due to deposition of cholesterol, but all these polys eventually break down and they release the small amounts of cholesterol that in their cytoplasm and then they form these cholesterol clefts and you see those in the dermis often in this condition. Maybe that's one there. Usually if you see it, it's, there's a lot, uh, but uh, here we really don't have that many, but this is EED. And we put it in for the, dip, the differential diagnosis of nodular and diffuse dermatitis with neutrophils. Sometimes you get quite a few neutrophils. Usually you see some neutrophils in ED, but this is really more the pattern that we see with vessels and neutrophils. And the, and the pathophysiology of this process is a chronic form of low-grade leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So normally we see leukocytoclastic vasculitis with palpable purpura. They get, uh, they get you know, secondary blisters, they get ulcers, they get all those kind of things. So it's almost kind of like a relatively rapid process. You get the vasculitis, you get the change in the skin, basically palpable purpura, then it resolves and then you get, you know, secondary crusting and whatnot. EED is more of a long-standing, slow, gradual, never-ending leukocytoclastic vasculitis. So you biopsy an early lesion of, of EED, and I've actually seen some biopsies of early EED, it looks like LCD. It looks like garden variety LCD, but instead of running a course that kind of comes and goes away and maybe comes and goes and, you know, periodically over the course of years, like it does with people that have idiopathic vasculitis or have HSP, this goes on and on forever. So it just kind of keeps coming and going and coming and going and staying in the same site and keeps coming and coming. And then it ends up forming these nodules with the fibrosis surrounding the blood vessels. So it's a chronic form of LCD, where the other is maybe a chronic relapsing and recurring form of, e, of, uh, of LCD. So it's, it's kind of the same deal. And if you work these patients up, they often have underlying conditions. They may have uh, underlying uh, monoclonal gammopathies. They may have uh, MGUS. They may have HIV infection. We actually wrote a few cases up a number of years ago uh, with the guys out of San Francisco of patients that have EED associated with HIV infection. So just realize that if you get this, you need to make sure the patient doesn't have a systemic condition associated with it. Strep has been associated with EED. So it's not only um, just a hitty, idiopathic, interesting finding. It can be associated with other conditions. Now, there's one other item that's the histologic identical twin of this. We've already talked about pemphigoid um, being the histologic identical twin of, of uh, pemphigoid gestationis. Um, the histologic identical twin of this is granuloma faciali. Again, a misnomer, there's not a single histiocyte in granular faciality. It looks just like this, only it's got, only it's on the face. So if you see something like this, it's not on volar skin like here, um, think about GF, 
which curves on the face. And uh, again, it was called granuloma faciale, not because it was granulomatous, but because it looks like a granuloma clinically. Uh, so the guys that described it back in the, you know, 19th century, whatever, they thought it was, you know, facial granuloma is what they called it. Okay, the last one of these we're going to talk about today um, is this condition. And there's another type of inflammation. Again, we talk about interstitial mostly inflammation. And we get interstitial mostly that's almost 100% comprised of polys, but it doesn't have like a suppurative, like an abscess-like formation, or it's not like a dense diffuse infiltrate like we see with, um, with sweets, for example. We see neutrophils that are present diffusely, just kind of over, over everything's involved, top to bottom, side to side. This has got some edema here associated with it. And we've got higher magnification, and all of these are neutrophils. Okay, so everything's neutrophils, diffuse, top to bottom, side to side, even going down into the fascia sometimes. Um, it's not really forming an abscess, but it's, it's neutrophils. Okay, and this is a different pattern. This is kind of what we call phlegmonous pattern. Phlegmon, go back in the days of, uh, you know, the medieval time periods and people had pus in their skin and whatnot, where they said, well, there was a phlegmon there. So this is what you see with cellulitis. So if you ever biopsy a patient got cellulitis, it looks like this. It's got neutrophils. So sometimes they start getting relatively abundant and kind of beginning to form little collections. But most of the time, it's just kind of a diffuse infiltrate, top to bottom, side to side of, of polys. And you can get some degeneration of the collagen. Um, you can get some edema. You know, these lesions are edematous. So if you ever see people that have cellulitis in their lower leg or their face or whatever, um, they can get some edema. So again, this is not the type of a situation where you have that dense infiltrate with edema that you see with sweets. This is edema because the entire thing is, is edematous. These people often have a peau d'orange appearance in their skin. The whole thing is edematous. And sometimes you'll actually end up getting some secondary um, papillary dermal edema like you see here. So this is cellulitis. And this is the same type of pattern if somebody's got necrotizing fasciitis. So if you were to, if somebody had necrotizing fasciitis and they had overlying cellulitis would look like this, but if you went down and did an incisional biopsy like you need to do um, in those patients with necrotizing fasciitis, it often isn't separative. They don't get pus that comes out of there when they go in and, and cut those things. One of the reasons it's necrotizing is, first of all, it's obviously a dissecting bacterial infection with all these polys, but it's not separative in the same sense that you get like with an abscess. And that's, why it's a bad, that's why it's worse than an abscess. An abscess in the old days, um, before they had antibiotics, surgeons going to drain an abscess, the patient would live happily ever after. If they had cellulitis, so-called blood poisoning, which is usually due more to strep, whereas uh, abscesses were due to staph, well, that often didn't go away. You couldn't surgically treat that because it was diffuse and it was dissecting when you get into your fascia and you get down into your vital organs and, and these patients, patients would die of septicemia. So in the past for antibiotics, we had strep. It was bad, it was, it was a death sentence in many cases. If you had staph, you were lucky because you could drain that out. But this, you can't drain. And so when you get necrotizing fasciitis, it's because of that pressure, that turgid you know, edema that compromises blood vessels and nerves and stuff like that. So you have to go in and do you know, an emergency surgery to relieve the pressure in that situation. So it's the same concept in cellulitis. It's more of a diffuse, inflammatory infiltrating, we call that this phlegmonous pattern, interstitial mostly pattern uh, that we see, but interstitial mostly with lots of neutrophils that sometimes form little small aggregations, more than neutrophil rich urticaria, but in the differential diagnosis of that and the neutrophilic um, inflammatory dermatoses, those usually don't give you this, this edema that you see here. So yeah, that's a, a brief uh, overview of uh, the urticarial infiltrates, neutrophilic dermatoses. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the pre presentation and uh, you'll couple this in with some of the other uh, material that you're going to see with uh, Dr. Vandergriff and others. So um, just remember that these patterns are important to know and hopefully uh, you'll recognize them when you encounter them. Thanks a lot.